And I really believe that that loving myself and then pouring that out to the people I come in contact with, that's the secret sauce to healing. That is truly at the core of healing. And I just, that's all I need to say. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Thrive State Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. V, triple board certified MD and performance longevity expert. And on this podcast, I have a really special guest, a doctor that actually went through three serious health conditions on her own. And I find that as healers, that they themselves who have gone through these miraculous health healing journeys are the ones that could best relate to us. And the things that she discovered after going through breast cancer at medical school, after then going through autoimmune disease and being told that she might need surgery for her gut, and then going through mold toxicity, She's none other than Dr. Jill Carnahan and her message of growing through these processes of understanding intuition and the different tools we can use in both the allopathic and alternative health space and how we live our life can actually all be medicines for our greatest growth and healing. If you are new to the Thrive State Podcast, welcome in. This is a podcast where we're bringing thought leaders, the habits, the mindsets, the messages, how we access optimal health, longevity, peak performance, so we have more joy, more happiness, more health, more abundance in our life. For those of you who are returning, welcome back. Thank you for making this such a popular show. If you haven't already, pick up a copy of my book, Thrive State at thrivestatebook.com. And please consider leaving us a five-star review wherever podcasts are heard. This will help messages like this uh, spread to more people across the world. My next guest today is Dr. Jill Carnahan. And let me tell you right now, you have to listen to the entire podcast because there is a snippet of such profound wisdom that my whole body had chills and goosebumps when I listen to this. So please stay to the very end and listen to that very last segment because it is a piece of wisdom that will shift your perspective on life, on health, on love, and on healing. I actually had an opportunity to introduce Dr. Jill Carnahan in a keynote talk at the anti-aging conference back in 2021. She's actually a leading voice in mold and mold-related illness. She's a double board certified physician known as your functional medicine expert and also referred to the Sherlock Holmes of medicine. In fact, she was recently featured in People Magazine for solving the medical mystery behind ABC's The Bachelor's Ryan Sutter's year-long battle with Lyme disease. This brings me to the next question. Did you know that over 70% of households in the United States are infested with often invisible mold? Pretty frightening. And it gets worse. Did you know that long-term mold exposure can lead to life-altering chronic disease, gut issues, autoimmune conditions, cancer, psychiatric related illnesses such as depression, anxiety, and brain fog? The list goes on. We don't only tackle mold in this conversation, but we also tackle other conditions like autoimmune disease and cancer, but through the lens of how we live our life, that how we live our life actually leaves clues to the information we are giving our DNA and our body. We understand that medicine can be all encompassing to include allopathic medicine, alternative medicines, PEMF, biohacking, lifestyle, meditation, Qigong, all these things can be beautiful ways and messages to give our bodies the signals of health. One of those signals being love. In this podcast, we really bring together the art and the science and a very beautiful conversation with such a beautiful human being. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill, welcome to the Thrive Day Podcast. Hello, great. Thank you for having me here. It is so great to be on. You know, the um, world of functional medicine and world of uh, integrative healers that, that step beyond traditional medicine lines is really growing. And to be able to introduce you on stage a couple of years ago, now having you on the podcast now and, and seeing us on, on the same platforms has been really, really cool to see where medicine and where practitioners are going. 
It is. Don't you just see more and more interest as our system continues to have some troubles with chronic and complex illness? It's exciting to see our colleagues kind of looking into this as an option. Yeah, absolutely. Now, before we dive into your new book, Unexpected, which I have a copy here and will be showing up, uh, showing everybody and, and bringing people to it. Before we get into that, we have a segment of the show called The Five to Thrive. It's really an opportunity to uh, give prizes to my guests. And that prize is really a healthy meal on me the next time we meet. Now, in order to win that prize, it's five quick questions answered uh, within 30 seconds each game show style. So I'm going to ask you, Dr. Jill, are you ready to play the five? Five? I am ready. <laughs> right, question number one was, was there ever a lie you were taught in medical school? Was there ever a lie? Yes. Was there any misleading information you were taught in medical school? Yes. Uh, don't trust your intuition. Oh, wow. That's a great one. Question number two is what was your favorite childhood memory? You know, I grew up on a farm with uh, one of five siblings, and my favorite memory is the Christmas that we got a four-wheeler, and then we all went out, hooked up a sled in with the snow, and we were like, you know, 12 and 10, and, and we ran and rode around in the snow and did wheelies and pulled that sled, and that was such a fun Christmas. Oh, wow. I, I'm really excited to ask my next question, would, would be, what is what activity brings you into the flow state? So there's two sides of this. The number one is being in nature because anything around water, nature, hiking, skiing. But the number two about that is pushing myself, which is rock wow. climbing, motorcycle riding, extreme skiing. So it's I can just be in nature, not extreme, and I can get in flow. But my other piece of that is I, I'm kind of a risk adventure taker kind of ah, person. So nature and adventure is the recipe for you. Uh, fun question number four is if you were trapped in an elevator, and you know you're going to be trapped in there for 24 hours. If you had one wish to bring anything from the outside world in, what would you what would you want with it? Well, I would say books, but now I would say my Audible account because I could listen to like <laughs> one of the 200 books. I could just I'll just tell you a really quick a 20 second story. Yeah. I got stranded. I was headed up to ski, and I actually like went up into a snowbank because the roads were so bad, and I just like flung. I I fell into this like off-road experience, right? My car is stuck off-road. My first thought was not, oh no, what's going to happen? Will someone tow me out? My first thought was, oh, I've got food. I've got water. I can listen to podcasts while I wait. <laughs> oh my God. I, I can't wait to dive into more of your story because your story is really about resilience. It's really about, you know, um, embracing the uncertainty. Uh, and, and, and I love that about you, but I'm going to have to ask the last question, see if you win the five to thrive. And the last question is, is this, uh, in 2023, what accomplishment would you like to reach most uh, uh, so that we, the universe could be listening to help you in achieving that goal? Oh, that's easy. Uh, I've been working for years on my book, which comes out March 7th, 2023. And you may not know this, a documentary. Oh, and yeah. So my goal, it's not about the money, the ego, none of that matters. But I do care about inspiring people to become their best selves. So my wish for 2023, that was that either the documentary or the movie or the book or whatever people come in contact, however, they touch my life and my life touches them is that they would be inspired to become resilient and to become the best version of themselves. Oh, that's so good. I mean, I think that's why we're here on this podcast together because, you know, that's certainly my mission too, because, uh, when people are the best version of themselves, I could just see, a, you know, humanity evolve into such a beautiful space. Uh, and we have so much potential as a collective uh, and, and loving community that's healthy and vibrant and has the energy to contribute to the world, right? Uh, you win the Five to Thrive. So the next time we meet, whether it be at the biohacking conference or at the A4M, a meal is on me. I can't wait for that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, I want to dive into your story a little bit. And, you know, people uh, probably already know that your story, being that you're going to be in this documentary, has so many lessons that, that other people could take on, you know. When this podcast gets released, we'll, it will be in 2023. People are going to be reflecting off the year. And some people would have had dealt with life-threatening disease. Some people would have had to deal with job loss or death of a loved one. I certainly know that I, that I have last year. Or these uncertain, you know, these unexpected Mm -hmm. circumstances yes. can you dive into a little bit of the crux of your book and how these unexpected circumstances in your life 
after even having training as a medical doctor like myself, you have an MD. What have you learned from these un these, these uncertain times? Yeah. So, and you're right. I bet anyone listening here has a story about 2022 that was tough. So as we enter this new year and start to hopefully become more resilient, I know some of you listening have had some really tough things and my heart just goes out to you. That is literally why I wrote the book, because what I learned at 25, when I was diagnosed with a very aggressive breast cancer in the middle of med school, all of a sudden my life took a turn and I was facing my own mortality. And I didn't know if I had six days or six weeks or six months or six years. I didn't know. Now I know I'm 20 years out from breast cancer. I survived. But at that moment, when you face the uncertainty of a trial or difficulty or suffering or loss of a loved one, you're, you don't know. And you're like, can I even make it through this? So my main message here is number one, yes, you can make it through it no matter what happens. And if we come to a circumstance that's unexpected and unexplainable or that involves suffering or illness or loss, and we're looking for what's the lesson, the pearl, the important piece here, all of a sudden it shifts because our mindset will look for the things we most want to see. So if we're looking for the badness, the difficulties, the awfulness, the grumpiness in the situation, we'll find it. But if we're looking for what lesson is here, and I learned that my very first experience by accident, because I heard a, a verse on the radio that talked about the sickness isn't going to end in death, but it's for a greater glory of a divine purpose, basically. And I'm very spiritual, but whatever you believe doesn't matter. The bottom line is when you can look for a greater purpose and meaning in your suffering, it transforms it. And now I look back, that was the best experience that could have ever happened to me as a doctor to set the tone for me being a patient, understanding the system and actually uh, thriving and becoming resilient despite a life-threatening illness. So I just, the, the encouragement to basically look to find those pearls. And I'll tell you one more thing about the title. It's unexpected because all these things are unexpected. Um, but the real title that I would have used if I could have easier for the publisher is unexpected miracles. It's looking for those things. And again, whether you have a faith or not, doesn't matter. It, the miracle, all it means is an unexpected circumstance that is better than expected. So having that lens on life, allows you to see the magic in things that can be incredibly painful and difficult. That's beautiful. Um, you know, Byron Katie has a beautiful quote that I love so much. She says, life is simple. Everything happens for us, not to us. And I could say that it took me some time to be able to, you know, I'm, you know, I'm an interventional radiologist by training. So I, I'm able to look at images in the past and, and then go, oh, okay, you know, I see something now. I, I, I saw it back then. Yes. And for me, it, it, it took a lot of personal development work to be able to see every sucky, unexpected, uncertain moment as a gift. Yes. Is that something that you developed pretty early on with your diagnosis? Or what was the path of really building that muscle of resilience to be able to, to see the miracles? Because now I'm pretty sure when, when, when something happens, you almost reflexively see the miracle in it. Yeah, this is learned. So any of y'all, they're like, I can't do that. Life sucks. This is so hard. Uh, believe me, I've been there. I know that it's not like I'm all, but I will say this. I was born with something that was a deep, deep abiding. I think of like Viktor Frankl and like man's search for meaning and yeah. his idea that no one can control our minds, right? No one can control our thoughts and our, the way we think about life. They can control our outside circumstances. They can take away our money. They, all these things can happen to us or for us, like you just said from uh, Byron Katie. But the truth is uh, we get to control how we uh, react or how we react to the circumstances. And the truth in that is that... Um, when something happens, we don't have the control. And often the control is the thing that we're grasping for in life. But if we can release and like surrender and live in the moment and allow what is happening to happen, we can always have enough resources for that moment. It's when we look back or we look forward that we maybe have this fear or something. And so bottom line from your question is I was born very optimistic and very full of a belief in something greater, yeah. but even so that first circumstance was devastating and it took me learning, okay, I survived that. Then next was Crohn's, then next was mold related illness. And then after that, I had a series of difficult relationships, divorce, death, you know, all kinds of things that in each one, I kept thinking, oh, this is hard. This, can I do this again? And I probably will in the future. Like I definitely know that there's purpose and meaning, but something's going to come next year or year down the road. And I'll probably face that again. So don't be discouraged if you're not always optimistic or full of faith. It's just a process. Yeah, no, each, each additional thing, you know, I, I thought 2020 was a very tough year for me, you know, when the pandemic first hit, um, and everything was shut down and whatnot. 
But 2022, oh my God, you know, between you know financial uh, investments that went sour to to very close people of mine committing suicide, yeah. uh, I look back and I'm like, oh my God, there was so much suck there. But as I sit in where I am now, I know that the person that I was five and ten years ago wouldn't be able to have the fortitude to be able to still continue on with the message um, of, 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 of healing, of, of growing, of, of knowing these things are a part of life. And so for, for anyone who might be going through something now and, and reevaluating all the suck that has happened um, in, in their life, just realize that, yes, it could stop us and we could be in vic victimhood. But I think like Dr. Jill and I is trying to say is they could also be moments of our greatest opportunities. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. You've gone through, um, you're a medical student and you've got breast cancer and then you find out you have an autoimmune condition later on. Did you start taking medications and, and going to what traditional, you know, conventional medicine says we should do when it comes to, to autoimmune disease? When did you start to shift and say, well, the answers might not be in traditional medicine? So I grew up uh, with a, a RN, a mother who was a nurse. Um, she was not practicing. She was raising her family of five children, but we had an, we had a farm and we had a huge, probably half acre garden. So we had lots of like uh, holistic based ideas on how to heal. We went to the doctor. There was nothing weird about that. But the first thing we do, if we had a cold or symptom, we go to food or we go to herbs or we go to something more natural. So I grew up with a more holistic mindset with, but with no problem with the medical community. And then I went into medicine and it's interesting because I thought, I always say I had the heart of a naturopath. My heart was much more holistic. How do we stay well? How do we thrive? And I went into medical school thinking that I actually applied to naturopathic, chiropractic, all kinds of other uh, uh, trainings. But what I realized was if I could get the best medical training in our current system, which is allopathic medicine, maybe not the best, but in our system, it's the most reimbursed yeah. and actually infiltrate the system, get to know the system and change it from the inside out. I literally went into medical school with a very clear mission. And then I get breast cancer at 25 in my third year, as you know, the most aggressive as far as rotations and the schedule's insane. It just, I don't even know how it survived, <laughs> but I get breast cancer. And what I did was I had a very aggressive disease. And when you talk about young women with breast cancer versus a 55, 60, 70 year old woman, it's a whole different ball game. The statistics of a young woman dying are, are incredibly high. So I was facing a life-threatening illness, absolutely. And so what I did is I did all of the best conventional therapy, but what I also did is prayer, meditation, net nutrition, herbs. Um, so I did both and I survived. But that conventional therapy, I remember this is important for your listeners because if you're facing a tough decision on treatment or lifestyle, what to do, mm -hmm. I did the best I could with the information I had at the time. And I decided I would make a decision and never, ever, ever second guess it. What happened was I did three drug, very aggressive high dose chemotherapy. I lost all my hair. I completely lost muscle in my ass. I was the most sick, malnourished person you could imagine. You see me now thriving, but I was so sick, so malnourished and so destroyed by the therapy that killed my cancer. So the cancer was easy. I got through that. I took care of the cancer. Afterwards, I was a wreck from the gut to the brain, to the skin, to the hair, no hair. So I get out of this therapy. I have no hair. I'm the lowest weight since like 12 years old, completely malnourished. My gut is destroyed by the chemotherapy. And as we know, leaky gut, that's how I became a gut expert is like my own gut was destroyed. And within six months after completing chemotherapy, I started having cyclical fevers, diarrhea, bleeding symptoms. And I was rushed one night to the emergency room, came out from surgery the next day from an abscess. And the surgeon said, Jill, you have Crohn's disease. Crohn's is an autoimmune disease where the body attacks the gut lining. Now it makes perfect sense because one of the drugs I did for chemo actually created permeability in the gut. My microbiome lipopolysaccharide coatings of the bacteria leaked into my immune system. I have a genetic predisposition towards Crohn's called NOD2. So I have this thing where my, that bacterial dumping into the bloodstream created an autoimmune response where it was a more aggressive than normal and caused damage collaterally to my gut lining, destroyed my gut lining. I couldn't absorb nutrients for anything. All that to say, my next thing was autoimmune. And I remember sitting with a gastroenterologist. He said, Jill, you're going to need lifelong drugs, immune modulating drugs. You're probably going to have your colon resected or multiple surgeries during your life. Um, this is incurable. And the last question to him was, okay, doc, I get this. This is serious. Um, does diet have anything to do with it? And I was truly clueless. Like I had started to learn nutrition, but I didn't know if diet could help Crohn's. Yeah. And so I was just honestly asking for an opinion. And this was a change in my life. That's why I'm telling you it's so important. I remember forever the moment he turned around and said, Jill, diet has nothing to do with Crohn's disease. 
And this is where the intuition kicked in. The medical school told me it has nothing to do with it. He told me it has nothing to do with it. But my intuition said, that can't be right. This is the gut. This is where we eat food. How in the world could diet not have anything to do with it? And the next two weeks, I went to the medical library and immersed myself in journals. And I came across specific carbohydrate diet. I was like, what do I have to lose? So I started to change a diet, got off gluten, got off inflammatory foods. Within two weeks, my pain, my bleeding, my symptoms, and my fevers were gone. Mm. And I knew I was like, okay, diet does have something to do with it. And then I went on to become a gut expert because I had to heal myself from Crohn's. And today, even though it's incurable, I don't have Crohn's. It's gone. It's not existent. This episode of the Thrive State Podcast is brought to you by the Thrive State Accelerator. The Thrive State Accelerator is actually a home course that I developed using the exact same techniques I work with my celebrity clients, CEOs, and executives on how to get them to the Thrive State. The Thrive State Accelerator teaches you how to master your seven bioenergetic elements. That's sleep, nutrition, movement, stress and emotional mastery, relationships, our thoughts and mindset, as well as purpose. In this Thrive State Accelerator, you're also going to get a bonus module on optimization. That's how I talk about supplementation, peptides, all the optimization techniques I use with my clients to get them to the Thrive State. Now, for some of you who are just joining us for the first time, you guys might be wondering, what is the Thrive State? Well, the Thrive State is actually the energy the epigenetic environment we give to ourselves, telling ourselves, telling our DNA how to act and how to respond. And if we want optimal health, longevity, and peak performance, if we can master these seven bioenergetic elements, our ability to have those three things that we just said, optimal health, longevity, and peak performance is at its greatest. And it also prevents you from getting chronic symptoms like brain fog, being overweight, feeling sluggish, acne, pain, all these chronic symptoms, as well as preventing you from getting chronic disease. So getting to that thrive state is really getting to that state to master being that very best version of yourself. So you could show up for you, for your family, for your business, everything that's important to you. So go ahead, check it out right now at kianvu.com slash accelerator and use coupon code podcast 25 for 25% off. Now back to the podcast. That's amazing. Um, you know, before we get into the mold thing, I'm very curious as your take, you know, some people will completely poo-poo uh, allopathic medicine altogether. Oh my God, that, that's that's all wrong. That's why we can't trust them. That's why we can't trust drugs altogether. Um, and then there are, there are the whole certainly natural, more holistic and integrative aspects of bringing things in. For some patients who are looking to be healed, how do they start to balance out messages they're getting from allopathic medicine with others and find the right solution for them? This is such a great question because I have staked my whole life on the dichotomy between two opposites and pulling them together. For right. example, science and faith, right? That's the book of like, how do you right. bring in intuition, right brain, left brain, science, faith. Same with allopathic medicine and alternative. I don't even like that term, but if you think about polar opposites, it's allopathic conventional versus alternative. The truth is when we, you and I have these toolboxes of what we can do with a patient, it's not that we exclude the allopathic tools. We have those. We can do surgery. We can do um, drug intervention. We can do uh, whatever interventional radiology, whatever we need to do to help the patient diagnose. But what we do is we have more. We have more lifestyle changes. We have more supplements. We have more herbal things. We have things like sleep, <laughs> some really basic things. We have, you know, PE. MF mats or whatever kinds of things we have to intervene. And I think of it as like, it's a, it's a conventional medicine plus it's a bigger toolbox because our goal is not just to slap a label and walk out the door with a prescription. Um, the, the conventional system says, get a label, get an ICD-10. And then here's the, the treatment. Usually it's a prescription, not always, but usually our goal is to say, why? Why did that happen? Why were you walking in this trajectory one day and you turned the corner and went into pre-diabetic state? And how can we go back to when that happened a play detective, find the root cause and reverse it. And mm. that's what gets me excited because we see things like Crohn's, which is considered irreversible. And I've seen not only my case, but multiple of my patients where it's reversed, it's gone. That's amazing. And what I love, um, you know, you saying is really more tools in the toolbox. You know, we have people that have one tool and will fight everybody else that has a tool that's different than theirs versus recognizing, oh my God, we are all 
you know, yeah, I think of the parable of the blind men feeling different parts of the elephant. And yes. you know, you know, oh no, the elephant's a snake because I'm feeling the trunk, or the elephant is is you know a, a, a big tree because it's feeling one of the legs. But if you could start to expose yourself to more things out there, it only opens up um the entire you know spectrum and vision. Um, and landscape of how you, you view health in the body, yeah? Well, yes, and I want to add one really quick thing because what I learned as I'm writing my book is one of the core components of genius is curiosity. Mm. And, and I would add to that humility because when we come to this medical enigma, it's complex. None of us have all the answers. And I always hope that I come with curiosity, number one, because I learn something from every patient, right? If we're curious. And then number two, humility and knowing I don't know all the answers and I'm okay with that. It's almost like uh, we're taught in medical school to have certainty and absolutes. But the truth is every single day, every single decision, everything we do is filled with uncertainty. And it's literally embracing that uncertainty with curiosity that allows us to open our mind minds. And you talk about mindset, curiosity opens your mind to possibility. Yeah. So that's really the key, whether it's your patient or your doctor is being curious and being humble. Oh, oh, so good. Now, breast cancer, autoimmune disease, and then mold toxicity. Yes. Tell us, you, you really went through the experience to be able to help you know others, but uh, tell us a little bit about that and, and really the statistics of the unhidden epidemic when it comes to um, mold or other exposures. Yeah. And you said it right. You nailed the, uh, you nailed it on the head because I was like, at, finally, I'm like getting through these things. And then I'm like, God, again, another guinea. I feel like I'm the guinea pig and every time I'm like, okay, here we go again. Now I'm kind of expecting whatever comes, I got to learn through this, but I went through Crohn's and cancer, got through them and actually started healing. I moved to Colorado to start my clinic in 2010. I was thriving. I was climbing mountains. I was hiking. I was running. I mean, I was healthy. And uh, the office that I moved to in 2012, uh, unbeknownst to me, had mold in the basement, small, not a big deal. 2013, massive flood of epidemic proportions in Boulder. They called it a thousand year flood, flooded the whole entire town and my basement included in my office. And then the next year I started having uh, headaches, skin changes, rashes, gut irritation, word finding difficulties, memory issues, uh, shortness of breath, all these things, which we now know are common to mold. And I knew something wasn't right, but I kind of ignored it. You know how we do, we push through, we get trained to kind of dissociate and go through and keep going. But all of a sudden it got so bad to where I was walking up the stairs to my office on the second floor and I couldn't have a conversation with the patient that was walking up with me. And I thought there's something wrong. So the next week I checked the basement with an inspector and we found bulk samples of Ketomium stachybotry, some really nasty black molds growing there. Um, I had a crawl space that was unfinished under my office and in the basement below that and all that was filled with issues. And uh, I tested my urine, found the same kinds of uh, mycotoxins from those molds called trichosithine. So it all matched up. I literally, the moment I got those results, I didn't set foot in my office again. I left, left everything. I really started over. That was 2015 and then started the healing process because I was really sick, way sicker than I had admitted. And mm -hmm. it's funny because cancer has a label. You lose your hair. People know what that is. Crohn's has a label. Mold was by far the hardest thing because on the outside, I mean, I had a little rashes and stuff, but I looked pretty healthy. People mm. did not understand. And inside I did not feel well, but that was then my education and how to get well from mold. And as you mentioned, the most important thing is so many people are experiencing mold toxicity and they might present with new onset lupus, multiple sclerosis, memory issues, cognitive decline, and they don't even know the root cause is mold. So this brings me to, to a criticism that some people have with functional medicine. Um, some people say that I go to a functional medicine doctors and there's all these different tests that they do that I have to pay out of pocket, you know, the test for all these different things. And, but we know the importance of, of finding something that might be a clue, such as mold or Lyme disease or things like that. How do you best approach when somebody comes in with maybe some milder forms of symptoms, how much they should be investing in their diagnostics, um, in their path of trying to figure out what's what's going on with them such a great question because i'm always at those crossroads too checking in financially what can you afford what can we do and here's what i think number one as we have experience um, we're taught in medical school objective science lab values all those objective types of data i love that i'm a science girl to the core but what i learned over time with experience is that our gut intuition 
um, which is actually just the processing of the subconscious of millions of pieces of data in a single fraction of a second. But it's based on our experience. We can't have a great intuition until we have experience over time, because those are data points in our brain that are being processed as we take in data. And I'm saying this for labs, because if you're a good clinician who has some experience and you listen and you get a great history and you listen carefully to the patient, the patient will tell you the answers. And what I do with labs is all I do with labs is prove my theory of where we're going. So I already have a really clear idea before I ever spend one penny of the patient's money on labs of where I, the likely diagnosis is. And I'm usually right on. And that's not pride. It's just experience, right? Same with you or any doctor. So if you get a good doctor who listens to you, you want to have a doctor who creates a safe space that feels collaborative. Number two, that listens to you. Number three, that gives you hope and gives you the sense that they're not that we have the answers to everything, but I've heard so many times the docs say, there's nothing more I can do for you. That is crazy because there's always something more we can do, even if it's just giving hope or being there for them. And uh, so all this to say, the testing is secondary. It proves the theory. And how I go about that is I'll start with regular labs that are through insurance. I can do that and do it through insurance. Um, I'll do a great history. And then we'll go with the other stuff as they're able, but I can usually prioritize. I love to have that extra data and it's incredibly helpful, like stool testing and urine testing. And for mold, for example, the history and a visual contrast test, which is free, are two great free screening tests. Yeah, tell us about the visual contrast test. Yeah, so this was started in the 1940s. They started it with armed services. And what it does is it tests retinal acuity for dark and white lines. So your differences between, it's like circles you can view. And if they're black and white, which direction they're pointing. And that visual acuity is based on retinal blood flow, which is some of the smallest blood vessels in our body. So what we found in the 40s is when uh, armed services or... Um, army or navy or whatever was exposed to a biotoxin like a chemical warfare agent they would see changes in retinal acuity so you could screen these people to see so again it's more than just mold it could be a biotoxin of any sort but it's a great free way and you can do it online or i do them in the office to check your patient's visual acuity and if it's impaired then you can say could there be biotoxin illness oh wow yeah that's a really great way to be able to test the microvasculature yes uh, after listening to you, I'm pretty sure so many people are like, well, if my doctor didn't go through three separate type of diseases to have had the life and the, and the intuition, you, how do I get a Dr. Jill? I know your, your wait list is five years off, but how do people start to even gather the type of provider that, that might, you know, have that integrated perspective uh, for them? Because I, yeah, I can certainly say that, that a lot of my colleagues in the hospital or, or not that that way certainly much more of us that have going that goes to the biohacking conferences the longevity yeah. conferences you know offer a, a different perspective but uh, how would you suggest somebody find somebody uh, that is you know open to go beyond their traditional training so such a great question because we need more doctors. And one of my passions with the movie, especially, is get to get other doctors who maybe don't know what else is available excited about going deeper because most of us went into medical school curious, interested in learning more, wanting to help patients, genuinely desiring to help people heal. And we got jaded from the system and we got overwhelmed by the bureaucracy and the paperwork and the prior authorizations. And even today, I still have some things that I'm like, oh, this is too much. But we get the joy back of what you and I have joy in what we do, because all of a sudden we're back to where we started with this curiosity, humility, and giving patients hope. And I get excited every day to go to work because I love what I do so much. So if we could uh, engage physicians in getting more excited about this, and I'm all about that, I'll try to keep training and helping physicians as you. But for someone listening who's a patient, like, what do I do? You want to find a doc who, number one, will listen to you. Number two is still curious. And number three is humble, kind of like we said before, because if you have someone who's humble and curious, they're going to go down that path with you. They may not know everything a functional medicine doc knows, but they'll at least listen to you and entertain your ideas of maybe more testing in this case. Or, And I would say, if you don't find someone, if you find someone who says, hey, everything's normal, your signs are all in your head, here's an antidepressant. That's a kind of classical response. And I hate that because that's like medical gaslighting. It's invalidating the patient's experience that they don't feel well. And, but because that person maybe says, I don't see anything on labs, I don't know the answer. And their ego prevents them from saying, I don't know, let's see if we can find some help. They just say, sorry, you need an antidepressant. 
that's not the kind of person you want. So you can clearly tell intuitively what feels right. And you want to get someone who's curious. They don't have to know everything. Um, and you as a patient become empowered. One reason I wrote the book is because I put so many things in there where you can do this yourself. Now you still sometimes need a provider for labs, but there's so much as a patient. If you, I have so many patients that come in and that help me learn because they're like, I ran across this rare autoimmune disease. I did this research. I'm like, tell me more. Right. So it's, it's the patients that's empowered you're going to get where you need to go. You're going to find the right people, but you have to have that I, that um, desire to learn more yourself too. Oh, beautiful. The book is unexpected. Finding resilience through functional medicine, science, and faith. I can't wait for people to get a hand their hands on it. Can you tell us about when the documentary is coming out? And, and are you able to share the title of the documentary yet? Yes. And that website should be coming to literally this week. Their team is working on it. So documentary is filmed. What happens with documentaries is we had a private investor that funded us. We filmed it all. Now we need to get it on Hulu or Amazon or uh, HBO or whatever. So that's called distribution. There's no distribution deal yet, but it's going to film festivals. And usually at those film festivals, someone will see it and say, hey, we want this film or they'll do a private screening or whatever. So we don't know yet, but the title is Dr. Patient. And it's doctor slash patient. The website will be doctorpatient.com. So soon you can find more info. You can watch the preview there. So we don't really know. I suspect it'll be either a special screening or on one of those channels or Netflix, who knows, in May or June or sometimes summer. Um, but honestly, we don't know. Stay tuned. And I promise if you visit me on the website, I'll keep everybody up to date, you know, where to find that. Oh, I just got goosebumps. You know, I, you know we're certainly connected in a lot of similar communities. I'd, I'd love to be able to help you find a distributor, um, and, you know, as we go. And, and I, I almost just wanted to say earlier on, right before you said that, that really the doctor of the future is you um, and that you are your best medicine. That's actually one of my one of the taglines I like to use. Uh, before I ask my very last question, where can people find out a little bit more about you and, and all the work that you do? So two things, my regular website where there's loads, like 10 or 12 years of blogs and free information, loads of videos, just jillcarnian.com. And there's tons of free stuff. So you don't have to pay a doctor. You can go there. You can listen to podcasts. You can watch, uh, listen to blogs, whatever you want to do there. The other one is readunexpected.com. That's the book site. There's also uh, freebies there. There's all kinds of giveaways. So jillcarnian.com read unexpected.com. And I hope a lot of the fun stuff I do is on Instagram and that's just Dr. Jill Carnahan. Come follow me there as well. Oh, wow. I, you can tell from her energy. She loves what she, she does and she lives uh, what she talks about as well. Now, going through everything that you've gone through, uh, divorce, cancer, mold, um, autoimmune disease, what have you found to be your best medicine? Uh, I just pause because this is the most important thing I'll say today. Love is at the core of all healing. And it's it starts with what I didn't realize. I grew up in a kind of fundamental culture where loving yourself wasn't acceptable. Mm. I had to learn to love myself and my cells. And you think autoimmune is attack a self, right? That's not just, that's metaphorical. And mm. if you hate yourself or, or dislike your body or dislike something about yourself, you'll never have the freedom and the safety for your body to heal. And so in order for me to heal, I actually had to love myself and then start trusting my intuition about what was right, what direction was right for me. But that I say as a foundation, because the true way that I help to heal patients and people in my life is that expressing that love to the people around me. Mm -hmm. So loving the patients, loving those people, like literally if I had one core wish for the rest of my life is how do I embody love in everything that I do? And I really believe that that loving myself and then pouring that out to the people I come in contact with, that's the secret sauce to healing. That is truly at the core of healing. And I just, that's all I need to say. <laughs> oh, so beautiful. Thank you. Goosebumps all over. Dr. Jill, thank you for being on the Thrive State podcast. You are welcome. Love your energy. Love your podcast. Thank you so much for all you do for the world as well. I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Thrive State podcast. And if this podcast is bringing a lot of value to you, if you find that your life is just improving with this podcast, that your life is getting to the next level, please consider supporting it. And here's a few ways you can do so. You can do so by liking this video and commenting on this video and also sharing this video with your friends and family. Another thing you can do is go to ratethispodcast.com slash Thrive State. Go ahead and leave us a five-star review there. It will really, really help your show grow. And it, this will give me more time so that I could actually give more content 
to you just like you got in this episode. And if you haven't already picked up a copy of my book, Thrive State, Your Blueprint for Optimal Health, Longevity, and Peak Performance, you can pick it up now. It became a number one new release in longevity. Go to thrivestatebook.com. And if you enjoy the book, please consider leaving us a review as well. And the last thing you can do if you're liking everything here and you want to work uh, more closely with me as well as my team to get you into the Thrive State, go to kianvu.com slash accelerator and consider joining the home course, the Thrive State Accelerator. It's really the course that I use. It's the concepts that I use personally when I work with CEOs, celebrities, and my high profile clients to get them to the Thrive State. Again, the Thrive State Accelerator at kianvu.com slash accelerator. And because you're a listener of this podcast, I want you to save 25% by using the coupon code podcast25. I hope we continue to give value to you. And remember always, you are your best medicine.